is J. Dyer, accurate in his representations of Catholicism whenever he engages it, and is he consistent with his own argumentation against the Catholic faith? Stick around to find out. You're watching Reason and Theology Live, a show dedicated to charitable discussions, debates, interviews, commentary, and analysis. And now, your host, Michael Lofton. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Reason and Theology. Your host, Michael. I want to review a couple clips here from Jay Dyer and ask the question, is he consistent with his own argumentation against the Catholic faith? And does he accurately represent Catholicism whenever he engages it? I want to start with a video clip from a video that he did called The Papacy is Circular. And having spent 10 years in Rome, I know how it works and I can attest to that fact. Because as soon as you start trying to figure out who's interpreting the popes or the councils correctly in Rome, there's a million different debates and nobody can know. Nobody can decide for sure. And it doesn't matter how many times the pope reaffirms something or restates something. You have to still assume that you are properly reading the pope. You see, so this is, this is a problem of circularity that the Roman Catholic epistemology thought it could solve by just adhering to classical foundationalism. Now, I want to show that even Jay Dyer doesn't believe what he is saying here. Because Dyer, whenever he argues against the filioque or against absolute divine simplicity, if a Catholic were to push back and say, wait, you're misrepresenting the Catholic perspective on the filioque or absolute divine simplicity, he says, no, this is the proper understanding of it. It is what has been dogmatized by Rome. And he's very adamant about his interpretation accurately represents what Rome has decided on the filioque and absolute divine simplicity. The problem here is that he is assuming that he has the ability to access the truth of what Rome has defined which is an admission on his part that Rome can speak clearly. Because if Rome was not speaking clearly on, say, the matter of the filioque or absolute divine simplicity, he would say to his Catholic inter interlocutors, well, you're right, you could interpret the filioque in a way that's consistent with Eastern Orthodoxy, because there's really no way to know what Catholics have decided about the filioque. You could read it in a way that's reconcilable with Eastern Orthodoxy. He doesn't take that perspective. He takes the position that, no, Rome has clearly spoken about the filioque, uh, filioque, and here's what it is, and it's contrary to what we as Eastern Orthodox have defined as the eternal manifestation of the Holy Spirit, and these are two contrary dogmas. And so, again, he assumes that Rome has spoken clearly on this issue. Well, if that's the case, then why does he present here the papacy and councils of the Catholic Church as just really loosey-goosey. You can interpret them in any which way whatsoever. Again, when a Catholic comes back and says, but wait, you're misinterpreting Rome, he wants to say, no, Rome has clearly defined the Thomas position on, uh, let's say, divine simplicity. Or no, Rome has clearly defined the filioque in a way that's contrary to the eternal manifestation of the Holy Spirit, as we see uh, presented by Eastern Orthodoxy. Moreover, I think that J. Dyer would also admit that the Catholic Church, for instance, definitively teaches the Immaculate Conception. I think that he would openly admit that. He might not agree with the Immaculate Conception, but he would openly admit that the Catholic Church teaches it. So the problem here is, he would recognize that the Catholic Church has spoken in such a way that it is clear that the Catholic Church teaches the Immaculate Conception, and it teaches it definitively. If somebody were to come to Dyer and say, no, I don't have to accept the Immaculate Conception as a Catholic, he would rightly push back and say, but yes, you do. Yes, you do. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. When he does that, he's admitting that the Catholic Church can be interpreted uh, as teaching the Immaculate Conception, and it's so clear in its teaching here that you can't interpret it in any other way. So again, Dyer himself doesn't really believe what he is presenting here. 
I'm not saying that he's intentionally trying to deceive people, but what I'm saying is at the very least, he's inconsistent because on the one hand, he presents Catholicism as you can interpret it every which way. And then on the other hand, no, he wants to say this is clearly dogmatic in Catholicism. And this is the proper interpretation according to Catholicism itself. And you can't deviate from that as a Catholic. His entire apologetic against Catholicism rests on the assumption that Rome can speak clearly enough to define the matter of the filioque or absolute divine simplicity. Because he then takes that interpretation and says, see, it's opposed to Eastern Orthodoxy. And it's opposed to what the church fathers taught in the first millennium. Therefore, Catholicism is wrong. His entire position depends on an assumption that is completely contrary to what he's presenting here. I guess he just hasn't connected the dots yet. Lastly, it is most certainly the case that if Rome is unclear on something or a council is unclear on something, we can continue to go back to the magisterium and ask for further clarification until we get to the point that it is so abundantly clear what the church is teaching that there's no other way to interpret it. Once again, the Immaculate Conception. Can anybody oppose the Immaculate Conception? Catholics, Orthodox, Protestants all recognize that Catholicism teaches the Immaculate Conception and that Catholics can't deviate from that teaching. Well, if that's the case, then everybody all around recognizes that the church can speak clearly enough to where we know there's no other way to interpret it. The church does teach this, and you're bound to accept it, and it teaches it definitively. Well, once again, if the church is able to speak that clearly in the case of the Immaculate Conception, we can continue to go in cases that aren't clear and ask for more clarification until the magisterium gives us that kind of definitive statement that is so abundantly clear that there's no way that we could possibly interpret it otherwise. Um, whereas you cannot do that in Eastern Orthodoxy, unfortunately. And you definitely can't do that in Protestantism. So here's where I want to say objectively we have a better position in the uh, Catholic Church of determining what is definitive and what is the proper interpretation of Scripture or what is heterodox versus what is orthodox. We can always ask for further clarification from the magisterium. Unfortunately, orthodoxy can't do that because it doesn't have an objectively identifiable magisterium on the universal level. And Protestantism can't do that because it does not believe that there are any infallible rules outside of sacred scripture. All right, so in this next video, I want to review some of his comments that he made about the Second Vatican Council, where I believe he misrepresents the ecclesiology of the Second Vatican Council. It's in a video called Church Papacy Schism, The Bizarre Metaphysics of the Papacy. Let's watch it together. That's the new ecclesiology. Father Peter Harris has a whole book on Vatican II's new ecclesiology. Which a lot of um, Orthodox have offered pushback against that book, by the way. So now, contrary to the clear, right, like you got to be in Christ, okay? There's no, there's no concentric circles of communion with Christ and the papacy. Now, the, the, this is the idea of the Roman Catholic Vatican II system. There's just this, we're all in kind of degrees, right, on a circle of concentric circles of communion. So the Roman Catholics and the Pope, like that's the highest level of communion. Eastern Orthodox, they're kind of like closest in a, in a, in a like one step removed degree of communion with the papacy. Then out here, we got the Protestants and the non-denominational guys because, you know, they still believe in the Trinity and the Incarnation. So they're just further out. Right. And then, oh, but and by the way, I'm not kidding. The new encyclical has prayers for Unitarians. That's, by the way, a misrepresentation. But let's let's move forward. OK, so then we can put the the, the Unitarians, the monotheists, uh, Muslims out here. And then even further out here on the spectrum is the pagans, Hindus, etc. Okay, there's no such thing as concentric circles of communion with the Pope as the head of the world religion. This is where the papacy is taking you, right? So do you see why I'm not trying to be angry and mean to Lofton or Frad or any of these people? I'm literally telling you, I, I believe that the papacy is structured to do this, to create this anti-church, a pseudo-church, 
because of its ecclesiological, Christological heresies, Trinitarian heresies, where all the world religions are in this new religion under Francis. All right. So there it is. We're hearing this notion that Vatican II's ecclesiology is such that it's really kind of preparing us for this one world religion where everybody is going to be in one religion under Pope Francis. Let's see if that is an accurate representation of the Second Vatican Council. We're going to go to uh, Lumen Gentium, which is one of the documents of the Second Vatican Council on the church. So let's start at paragraph 14. It says, This sacred council wishes to turn its attention firstly to the Catholic faithful, basing itself upon sacred scripture and tradition. It teaches that the church, now sojourning on earth as an exile, is necessary for salvation. Christ, present to us in his body, which is the church, is the one mediator and the unique way of salvation. So it's already recognizing the unicity of Christ. There's only salvation in Christ through his church. There's not salvation in any other name under heaven. In explicit terms, he himself affirmed the necessity of faith and baptism, thereby affirmed also the necessity of faith. For through baptism, as through a door, men enter the church. Whosoever, therefore, knowing that the Catholic Church was made necessary by Christ, would refuse to enter or remain in it, could not be saved. Now, how would it be possible for Pope Francis to rule a one-world religion or for the papacy to have a one-world religion when the Second Vatican Council itself is insisting on salvation only in Christ and that outside of the church there is no salvation? Now, it does go on to talk about those who are related to the body of Christ in one way or another, in various degrees. So what Dyer was speaking about there with concentric circles, there's a grain of truth that there are some who are more related to us than others. Clearly, the Eastern Orthodox are much closer to us than the pagans. But that does not mean that there is literally going to just be this one world religion where we're all part of just one religion under the Pope. The Second Vatican Council teaches nothing of the sort. It speaks of Eastern Orthodox and Protestants and how related they are to us. Eastern Orthodox more than Protestants, so Protestants to a lesser degree. It then even speaks of those who are part of Islam, and it speaks of the Jews, and then it speaks of pagans, and those who have not even come to an explicit um, profession that there is a God. It speaks about them, and it notes in what way we can or can't say that they're related to us. Now, obviously, somebody who is a pagan is going to be much further away from the truth than somebody who is, for example, um, somebody who professes to hold the faith of Abraham. That's all the Second Vatican Council is doing here. It's not preparing us for a one-world religion. It's not teaching indifferentism. It's not teaching universalism. It's not saying, hey, everybody can be saved regardless of what they are. That's not at all what it's teaching. And it would make no sense for it to say that in light of what it just said in paragraph 14 at the very beginning. All right, so in this next video, I want to show you where Dyer, whenever we try to make distinctions and offer pushback against the way he portrays Catholicism, maybe he's not making the appropriate distinctions, he tries to offer this pushback that we're just playing with words. We're just engaging in shibboleth, to use a biblical phrase. We're just using these arbitrary distinctions, and we're just playing with words and effectively engaging in sophistry. Now, if one were to ask Dyer about his understanding about the essence and energies distinction, and one were to say, oh, well, I think that that sounds like you're denying 
simplicity. You believe God's made of parts. He would deny that. Or if somebody were to say, well, it sounds like you believe in more than one God with your understanding of the essence and energy's distinction. I'm not saying that it actually teaches that. I'm just saying that there are some who would try to offer that pushback to Dyer and say, well, it sounds like you're teaching that there are many gods whenever you speak of this distinction between essence and energies. And he would rightly push back and say no. And he would offer a qualified, nuanced answer with all kinds of distinctions. But again, whenever we do that, he wants to say shibboleth, and you're just playing with words. And so I think that there's a misrepresentation of the Catholic perspective oftentimes in his presentation of Catholicism. And whenever we go to offer a more nuanced approach and some pushback, he doesn't want to accept it. But if somebody were to offer him pushback on his views, he would then employ distinctions and um, would try to show why somebody has uh, misunderstood his position. Let's take a look. This is from a recent video between Gideon Lazar and Jay Dyer, where they're talking about um, an issue involving divine simplicity. Let's take a look. And by the way, I did edit out uh, the profanity that Dyer used in this video. Tell me what that means. I agree it's about first and second actuality. Right. I completely agree. Yeah, and so that's what that's the sense in which it was meant. So it doesn't that's what that's the twofold sense in question 25 for power. I agree, yeah. Okay, so the wording itself, which is what you guys do, shibboleth, you obsess over words. So his problem here is that whenever somebody responds to his criticisms of Thomas Aquinas, whenever somebody offers some pushback and wants to say, but wait, you're not appropriately understanding what Aquinas means by this, he wants to say, you guys are just playing with words. But again, if somebody were to do that back to him, and say, well, um, I think that you're teaching on the essence and energies. It, it, it's just saying effectively that there are many gods. He would say, no, you're completely misunderstanding my position. And he would then go to offer distinctions. Well, that wasn't even the point, and you know it. Well, I have not it's gotten involved. Autistic, and you want to play gotcha over stupid words, dude. I'm trying to discuss what word, how St. Thomas uses no, certain words. No, you weren't. You wanted to play <laughs> in the chat. That's all you wanted to do. All right. And you got shown up and classical theists told you that you were wrong. So all you want to do is come here and save face and argue over words. That's what you guys do. This is why you guys are a joke and ridiculous. You don't, you don't act normal. You don't act like human beings. You act like fucking robots. We just want to play gotcha. Because you're a Spurg, dude. That's why. All right, I guess I'm a Spurg, but that doesn't affect at all whether or not I'm correct on this issue. The question is, and it, it, it does. All you care about it, the it, it, words. Jay, it genuinely point. seems like we agree for the most part. I don't know why we're yeah, coming so into a big exactly. argument. So you have a fucking problem. You have a mental problem. And you just couldn't admit that in the chat that even though we agree, you had to come here to try to play gotcha. Jay, I was trying to get you to ask if ask you do you think saint no, thomas not. thinks there's potential gotcha in god you want to play gotcha on somebody who's you perceive as your enemy or some stupid internet dispute that's all you wanted to do that's all you guys care about is gotchas over a word when you admit it that we mean the same thing how gay is that all right, if we mean the same thing, then when I had simply asked you about potentia and God, you could, you could simply you say. Did. You wanted to try to play right. over that you're the Latin expert. I asked As you whether or not you know Latin, Latin. so we, but I wanted to know if we could discuss the Latin text of St. Thomas. Not That's not why. You wanted to show out. Do you know Latin, Jay? I don't know Latin. I've never claimed to know Latin. I don't care about knowing Latin. So you don't, there's, there's a huge number of medieval texts you cannot read in this debate that are not translated if you don't know Latin. All right. So I think that that's enough to get the point here. The discussion went a lot longer, but what um, the Byzantine Scotus is trying to do is say, look, on this particular point, we're really not that far off. And this is something that I notice happens a lot whenever somebody tries to engage Dyer and say, look, actually, we, we might really not have irreconcilable differences on, say, absolute divine simplicity or the filioque, he wants to say, no, we do. We have 
irreconcilable differences. And again, if a person wants to say, but wait, you're, you're kind of misrepresenting the position here. Let me offer you some important distinctions. Oh no, shibboleth. You guys are just playing with words. But once again, if somebody were to challenge Dyer or misrepresent his perspective about the essence and energies distinction, he would then employ distinctions. So it seems that he is misrepresenting Catholicism and in some ways being inconsistent. Now, in this next video, I want to show where Dyer has some inconsistencies and also unfortunately misrepresents the Catholic position on a number of issues. This is from a video that he had a few years back. It's titled J. Dyer versus Uniate Luke Dalvin absolute divine simplicity. It was a debate that they had. Let's watch it together. And by the way, once again, I did edit out the profanity used by Dyer. Neither is the damage that comes along when Don Scotus comes along. Yeah, and, and it doesn't matter what Scotus said, because what Rome eventually dogmatized was not the Scotus <laughs> position. Oh, now notice that. So what Dyer is trying to say is that um, Rome did not dogmatize the Scotus position of divine simplicity it dogmatized the thomas position which is not accurate um, because he hangs his hat on the first vatican council which just speaks of simplicity in a very generic way it does not define it in any kind of way that specifies what version a thomist version a scotus version a palamite version it, it, it just speaks of simplicity in a very very generic way but notice here He's saying that no, a Scotus interpretation of Vatican I's understanding of divine simplicity is excluded. But I thought earlier he told us that you can just interpret councils and popes in any which way, and that that is a problem with Catholicism. But here he's saying no, it's clear enough that Vatican I is not teaching a Scotus interpretation, it's teaching a Thomist interpretation only. Once again, there's an inconsistency here with Dyer, whenever it's convenient for his position, he wants to say that Rome has spoken clearly. When it's not convenient for his position, he wants to say that, well, it's just, you can interpret councils and the papacy any which way. Okay, we, we've been saying story. this the whole time. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's still a lie. It's just a perspective. It's not a lie. <laughs> it's not a lie because Scotism is not the normative position, nor is it the dogmatic position on what absolute divine simplicity is. But again, if you can interpret documents in any which way, I guess you could still hold the Scotism. And therefore, the Catholic position of divine simplicity is not absolutely irreconcilable with the Eastern Orthodox understanding of divine simplicity. But that doesn't work for Jay because he wants to say that Catholicism has dogmatically defined something heretical that's incompatible with Eastern Orthodoxy. And neither is the Aquinas. Bye. The the absolute divine simplicity uh, uh, defined in the Roman dogmas is absolutely more in line with Aquinas. It's more in line. Now you're Correct. giving room. Thank you very much. It's not. No, no, no because not, because nobody says that every single statement of not, Thomas not nobody says that every statement of Thomas Aquinas is part of dogma. If you read Denzinger, right. there's a whole lot of statements in Denzinger right. about divine simplicity. And one way that we know that they teach the more Roman Catholic or the more Thomistic view is because they teach the double procession of the filioque. They don't believe in eternal manifestation. They don't ever talk about the uncreated energies. Once again, he is assuming that Rome has clearly spoken about the issue of the, of the filioque in such a way that it is irreconcilable with orthodoxy. Moreover, I think that there's a serious problem here. Because Orthodox scholars such as Dr. Edward Sachinsky note that by the 6th century, you have a general consensus in the Western Fathers of the Filioque, teaching the Filioque. And Eastern Orthodox were in communion with these Western Filioquists. So if the Filioque is heretical, then that means that the Eastern Orthodox were in communion with heretics, which is a problem for Dyer because he often comes back at Catholics and says, this is an issue for you because you guys are in communion with this or that person and they're a heretic. Well, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Here's what Dr. Sachinsky says in his work, The Filioque, uh, the Filioque History of a Doctrinal Controversy, page 64. 
Actually, it's page 65. Even if one discounts those passages that modern scholarship has shown to be interpolated or spurious, the passages that follow clearly demonstrate that by the late 6th century, the Filioque achieved a level of acceptance in the West bordering on unanimity. So here he's saying there's effectively a unanimous view among the Western fathers teaching the Filioque, and yet the Orthodox were in communion with them. By the way, Photius, who wrote against the Filioque, goes back into communion with Rome and dies in communion with Rome, knowing that the popes were teaching the doctrine of the Filioque. They may not have been in favor as far as by way of discipline of adding the Filioque to the creed at this time, but they were certainly in favor of the doctrine and the orthodoxy of the doctrine. And then Photius here goes into communion back with Filioquist popes and dies in communion with them. If you take a look at this book called The Photian Schism by Francis Dvornik, he demonstrates that there was no second Photian Schism, that actually Photius died in the peace of the Catholic Church, knowing that the popes taught the Filioque and, by the way, the papal dogmas, the papal doctrines and claims of papal supremacy and infallibility. So certainly take a look at that book where you see an Eastern Orthodox pillar dies in communion with the Filioquist, knowing that he's a Filioquist. That causes problem for Dyer's position if the Filioque is heretical. The more Roman Catholic, or the more Thomistic view is because they teach the double procession of the Filioque. They don't believe in eternal manifestation. <laughs> they don't ever talk about the uncreated energies, nor does Scotus, by the way. And by the way, one other thing that you'll want to take a look at, this is a book called For the Unity of All by John Monasukas. There's actually a forward here by the Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew, which um, I don't believe Eastern, um, I don't believe Jay Dyer's uh, version of Eastern Orthodoxy is currently in communion with. But uh, for those who do still appreciate the Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew and are still in communion with him, uh, those Eastern Orthodox may be interested in this work by Father Monasukas, who shows in his work that there is actually a way to understand the Filioque that is reconcilable with the Eastern understanding of this issue, uh, especially involving the Holy Spirit. And he's relying on St. Augustine and his understanding of the Filioque. Okay, so certainly check that out. Let's continue. Okay, whatever. No, you don't know what eternal manifestation is. You don't know what that is. Do you know what eternal manifestation is? Eternal manifestation of the nature? No. The okay, orthodox so, dogma of the spirit. Do you even know what that is? Maybe not. Maybe you No, of course you don't. Of course you don't. Okay, well then tell me, Jay. So as you Tell can see, right this guy who comes right to the table now. who wants to debate doesn't even know what our positions are. He doesn't even know what the Palamide Councils uh, defined when it comes to Senator Blackerne, when it comes to eternal manifestation, which it's only possible to believe in eternal manifestation if you believe in the essence energy distinction, which he doesn't no. make this connection. Yeah. He has no idea what he's talking about. BS, BS, BS. Your claim is that it's Catholic dogma, absolute Aquinas, absolute divine simplicity. It's not. It is. That's my point. Don't go over the place. The way that the it, way that Vatican I and the way that multiple places it, in Denzinger speak of the simplicity it, of God it, are in the, the Thomistic sense. The irony, again, I have to point it out, is that he's assuming there's no other way to read Vatican I when it comes to divine simplicity. It has to be understood in the Thomistic view. And that is the way that Rome has defined it. But again, earlier we saw at the beginning... He said, you can interpret councils any which way. No, no, just the existence of the Franciscan school tells, tells me you're wrong. It doesn't matter story. if there's a Franciscan school because that's, that's prior to that's the later bad. definitions that I'm talking about. And the later definitions do not exclude the Scotist view of divine simplicity. Because if you look at the First Vatican Council and what it teaches about simplicity, it is very, very generic. It accounts for 
an allowance for the Thomistic view, the Scotus view, a Palamite view. In other words, in Catholicism, this particular issue has not been settled. The only thing that is settled is that God is simple, but specifics on what that means hasn't been fully addressed yet. Here's what the First Vatican Council says. Since he is one, singular, completely simple, and unchangeable spiritual substance, he must declare to be in reality and in essence, distinct from the world, supremely happy in himself and from himself, and inexpressibly loftier than anything besides himself, which either exists or can be imagined. That's it. That's all. It's not going to give us a version that says you have to understand simplicity only in this Thomistic way, excluding a Scotus view or a Palamite view. That is just simply not there. School tells it tells me you're wrong. It doesn't Let matter if there's a Franciscan school because that's that's prior to that's the later bad. definitions that I'm talking about. What? <laughs> I'm okay, talking about Vatican that. One. Prove that. Prove that. I'm talking about Trent. I have a whole essay that cites nothing but the dogmas, which I don't even think you've read. I sent you that essay. No. You didn't read it. Yeah, but you said the essay is there, and now we're just in ADF there. It's not. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're... In, my, in my argument, in my essay, I cite Vatican One. Yeah. I cite multiple papers. Yeah. I cite created yeah, gra I cite right created grace. I cite it's dogma. It's these, not. these are the results of that dogma, and they are that dogma. No, if you read that paper, you would know that. Interpretational schools no. tolerated. No, nope. that's why that's dogma. why that's why our church doesn't have all the crazy retardo mess of your church. That's why we don't have all this nonsense that you have that you're in communion with. Once again, he goes to the point of you guys are in communion with all these problematic people, but he doesn't ask the question, well, wait, how does this work for me as an Eastern Orthodox, where I am claiming that Orthodoxy anathematizes filioquists, and yet my church was in communion with filioquists and venerates filioquists and considers filioquists saints like saint augustine he doesn't ask the question how does this work with the fact that orthodox in the east were in communion with these filioquists and my church venerates a filioquist multiple filioquists and then one of the pillars of orthodoxy that we venerate photius died in communion with the filioquists and a papal supremacist that's ridiculous. What it's you not said. ridiculous because absolute divine simplicity yep. is the basis of perennialism. Your Vatican II no, sect teaches perennialism. Right. So there's the claim once again that Vatican II teaches perennialism. We saw the exact opposite where Vatican II teaches the unicity of salvation in Christ in Christ alone. So he once again misrepresents the Second Vatican Council. Right. Oh, Lord. Now we're going all over the place. It's about ADSB and dogma. Correct. It and that's dogma. what it leads to. It isn't dogma. It is dogma. I I show you in my fucking essay. No. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Which you don't yeah, even know the basic guy. terms of our position. You've already yeah, demonstrated that and admitted that. You're one guy. You're, you're one guy. No, no, no. <laughs> it doesn't matter if I'm one guy. It, none of that matters. Yeah. All I have to do is cite your dogmas. Yeah, no, no, no. You yeah, with your weaponized ADS. Yeah, because any typical Roman Catholic dogmatician will tell you what I say. But I thought that, again, you can interpret Catholic dogmas in any which way that you want. According to Jay, you can. No, a Thomist will. No, I can cite you other Roman Catholic dogmaticians that will say what I say. Jesuits will say this. <laughs> yeah, Jesuit yeah, dogmaticians Jesuit. will say this. Yeah, what about Franciscans? It doesn't, it doesn't matter that there was a school of Franciscans you know prior to Vatican yes, I. Does. Do you understand that Vatican I has a definition of simplicity? It, has, it doesn't have your weaponized one. It's not a your point. It absolutely one. does because guess what? The filioque okay. is part of that. Do you understand oh. that? And again, he is saying that, well, the filioque has been dogmatized, and that assumes a particular understanding of divine simplicity. Not only is that debatable, but it creates a major problem still for Dyer since, once again, Orthodox venerate filioquists on their liturgical calendar. 
and Photius was in communion with Filioquists. And the West, by the 6th century, was teaching the Filioque, and the East was in communion with the West. And those Western fathers who were teaching the Filioque are venerated in Eastern Orthodoxy. So it's still a problem for Eastern Orthodoxy. No, it isn't. It is because you don't even understand what eternal manifestation is. No, if you understood it, you would know that. The Vatican no, clarification no, on the Filioque missed this. No, no, no. But it doesn't. Have you, it, have you read the Vatican clarification on the Filioque? Yes, I have. Okay. Then you would know this because it talks about eternal manifestation. And what if a Catholic wants to interpret these clarifications in a way that's consistent with an Eastern Orthodox understanding of eternal manifestation? What would be wrong with that, according to Dyer, who says that you can interpret these things in any which way you want? Well, that doesn't work in his favor at that point, so he's not going to take that approach, unfortunately. So there's an inconsistency here. I also will point to a video that I did with Dr. Goff, Dr. Goff, Jared Goff. I will put it there in the description, in the show notes, where he shows how the filioque as defined by Rome is consistent with this notion of the eternal manifestation of the Holy Spirit in Eastern Orthodoxy. So an expert, Dr. Jared Goff, shows how they're compatible over and against Dyer. So I don't think you've read it because you would know that. Right, because manifestations from will and manifestations no, no, from nature. No, it has nothing to do with that. Okay, it has nothing to do with that. Right. Okay. You said it was based on double procession filioque. Correct. ADS is the, yeah, root, well, is the root of that. That is a heretical, that is a heretical filioque. No, it's Nobody not. It's, it's the way Florence that, defines it, you retard. No, 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 no. You just read the reduction of every filioque as dual source. Uh, I can look at Denzinger right now in Florence and read it to you about the double procession. Would you like me to do that? Yeah, go ahead. Because it's not double procession. It'll say from the sun. But it won't. It ahead. says that it says that there's there's a you, that the father and the son are a co-cause of his hypostasis. Yeah, of course it says that. The Vatican clarification says that. That's not double procession. So what does co-cause? Of mean? course it's a double procession. That's what the fucking word means. No, 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 no. You mean no? There would be two paternal processions if it was co-causal in the sense of double procession. You can be a cause. Of it says that the father and the son are the co-cause of his hypostasis, dude. Yeah, but that's then packed with your interpretation, which is I, which. I, I guess, I, dude, there's two different churches over this. It's not just my interpretation. Dude, I'm representing the Orthodox God, Church. God, the Orth. Listen, so the Orth. So, um, Dyer is claiming that his position here represents the Orthodox Church. See, however. The North American Orthodox Catholic Consultation on the Filioque has said otherwise. And this is on the Go Ark website. Now, obviously, um, Dyer is no longer in communion with the Patriarch of um, Constantinople, but he was at one point. And the church that he's part of right now did not divide with the Patriarch of Constantinople over this issue. So this would not be a matter that should be in dispute. And in this dialogue, you can see, and again, the document, the Filioque, a church dividing issue, an agreed statement here between North American Orthodox Catholics, um, Orthodox and Catholics. You have the point at the very end where we have both agree on both sides that it says, that in the future, because of the progress and mutual understanding that has come about in recent decades, Orthodox and Catholics should refrain from labeling as heretical the traditions of the other side on the subject of the procession of the Holy Spirit. So I would just simply point out that Dyer does not accurately represent Catholicism or the Eastern Orthodox position. So in conclusion, we see several instances where Dyer misrepresents the Catholic position when he engages it. But most importantly, he is inconsistent with his own arguments against the papacy because the vast majority of his arguments against the Catholic Church on his channel hang on the assumption that you can accurately understand what the Pope or a council has said, but then elsewhere 
He says that the Catholic Church can be interpreted in any which way, the papacy and the councils can be interpreted in any which way, and therefore it is not a strong authority that can answer our questions in any kind of definitive way. So his entire apologetic against the Catholic Church falls apart by his own argumentation elsewhere. I hope this was helpful. If so, hit that like button and the subscribe button and be sure to check me out, patreon.com forward slash reason to theology if you want to support me. We'll see you later. God bless. Oh wait, before you go, I would really appreciate it if you would consider supporting this channel. This is my primary means to provide for my family and it also helps me to produce content like this video. If you would like to support me, become a patron by visiting patreon.com forward slash reason and theology. You'll also get access to extra exclusive content when you become a patron. Lastly, hit that like button and the subscribe button and be sure to leave a comment down below. God bless. If you're looking to buy or sell a home, office, or any kind of property anywhere in the world, you're going to want to call Real Estate for Life and they're going to connect you with a Catholic agent. Now that agent will donate a portion of their commission upon sale and Real Estate for Life will donate 75% of that gift to a pro-life organization at no cost to you. Call Real Estate for Life at 1-877-LIFE-US1 or text them 248-431-1440. If you care about the pro-life cause, call them now.